All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special speaker series on climate change and adaptation. My name is Daniel, program officer with the Canadian Wildlife Service and education coordinator with Cape Germain Nature Centre, and I will be your MC throughout today's event. Uh, before we get started, I would like to invite up uh, one of our Board of Directors members to provide a few opening remarks. Uh, just before then, though, I would like to note that today's event is being live streamed and recorded. Uh, for those of you participating virtually, the webinar program comes with a live chat feature, which can be accessed on the right side of your screen or along the bottom if you're on a phone or a tablet. And this is a great feature for asking questions and for socializing with other viewers. And so please feel free to type in a friendly hello. Uh, I will also note that this is the first time that we have live streamed an event like this. And so uh, I do apologize in advance if we have any technical issues. Uh, for those of you uh, listening in virtually, please do let me know if there's any problems with the video or audio. And if at any point uh, you do disconnect or have technical problems, then I suggest that you try refreshing your web page uh, or restarting your device. And if you accidentally close the webinar program, then you can reconnect using the link that was sent to you via email. And so with all of that uh, out of the way, I would like to invite up Thaddeus Halonia from Cape Germain Nature Center's Board of Directors to provide a few opening remarks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, welcome. I guess uh, first I would like to acknowledge that we are located within the territory of the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq. Our relationship and our privilege to live and work on this territory was agreed upon in the Peace and Friendship Ter Treaties of 1752. Because of this treaty relationship, it is to be acknowledged that we are all treaty people and have a responsibility to respect this territory. On behalf of the board, volunteer and employees of Cape Germain Nature Center, I would like to welcome you to this year's annual speaker series and this year's subject climate change and adaptation. So much is present with Fiona's impact and dramatically felt this past week on all of us. So it's very timely. I thank you to Hillary and Dan and all the employees here, the tireless dedication to keep our, all our activities at the center present and pertinent, to keep the trails open. And I invite you all to go out and investigate our uh, beautiful uh, center here outside after our speaker series. I hope you will follow us via social media and keep in touch with our activities and our partnerships in various corners of Atlantic Canada. A couple of things to watch are the progress of the commission to the renowned traditional canoe builders, Todd and Melissa Labrador, who are uh, building a beautiful ocean going canoe in their workshop, which will move here next spring. Also our partnership with the students at the Pierre Lassonde School of Fine Arts at Mount Allison University and their photo project, which they're about to embark on here at Cape Germain Nature Center, which will become an exhibition at the Purdy Crawford Center for the Arts and as well as here at the center next spring. Thank you. All right, thank you, Thaddeus. So before I invite up our first speaker, uh, please allow me to provide an overview of today's event. And so our speaker series will be comprised of three presentations, beginning with Dr. Jeff Allerhead from Mount Allison University, whose topic is expect the previously unexpected shoreline change and accelerating climate change. This will be followed at 11 a.m. by Amanda Marlin from EOS Eco Energy, who will speak about uh, community-based adaptations and approaches. And last but not least, at 12 p.m., uh, Alicia McGratton from Nature NB will present on monitoring monarchs and milkweed in New Brunswick. Each presentation will be approximately 40 minutes with an additional 10 minutes for questions and we'll be aiming to wrap up today around 1 p.m. For those of you here in person, you're invited to stick around afterwards to chat and to tour Cape Germain. Uh, finally, there are some complimentary refreshments in the back, so please feel free to help yourself. I suppose more over to the side here. And uh, for those of you uh, in person here today, washrooms can be found down the ramp on the right near the back entry doors. And so without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Jeff Allerhead is a member of the Geography and Environment Department at Mount Allison University in Sackville. Uh, he is a coastal geomorphologist who studies beaches and salt marshes, 
and in recent years he has been particularly involved in designing and monitoring salt marsh restoration in the Upper Bay of Funday. Can I please have a warm welcome for Dr. Allerhead. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know a few of the people in the room, uh, and others I guess I will meet shortly. Uh, I'm not going to speak for the entire 40 minutes because I want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, those who have seen me teach know that I'm capable of remembering and following about three threads, and that's about it. So I have designed this presentation with that in mind. I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and what we know. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the impacts of climate change are, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do about it or what we might choose uh, to do about it. I would like to start with a few acknowledgements, though. I mean, my work wouldn't be possible if I didn't have funding. Um, Ducks Unlimited Canada and the uh, New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund in particular um, have been supporting me for quite a number of years on a variety of different projects and many others. And I suppose if I hadn't had to send this slide on Wednesday, um, I could have uh, given credit to Ian as well. Um, but I do have to acknowledge Fiona because uh, as of last weekend, I completely rewrote parts of this talk um, because now I don't have to explain some things or perhaps convince uh, some audience members of certain uh, factual uh, pieces. I just want to make sure that people know who the IPCC or what the IPCC is. You hear it a lot. Um, the IPCC, it's an international body uh, that exists. It's a creature of the World Meteorological Organization and the UN Environment Program. It was started in 1988. And, you know, essentially what they do is they look at the science related to climate change and try to pull it together in what I would call a balanced way. And one of the challenges that we have when anytime you get whatever, thousands of scientists together, you tend to get um, predictions and so on, which are at the low end of what might happen because you don't want to be overly alarmist and you don't want to be accused of being alarmist. So the default is to, is to tend to go towards the lower end. And I'll return to that subject a couple of times because in fact, every time we take measurements, every time we have a new report come out, we find out that things in fact are a little worse or a little faster or a little more dramatic uh, than were predicted. And I haven't seen yet, I don't think one report where it's gone in the other direction. So, you know, with that, if you're interested in following the IPCC, we are now on to the sixth assessment report. So these are reports that have been coming out every, uh, you know, number of years. And there's a whole series. I mean, really, you could spend the rest of your career um, reading these reports. They're incredible. There is so much information on the IPCC website, it's numbing. Um, because every report has technical reports behind it. And every technical report has other information behind it. It's all peer-reviewed. Um, you know, it's as good as it gets. Are the dissenting voices? Of course, you can't find 100 people and not find somebody who dissents. Um, but one of the challenges we often face is that when media do stories, they feel compelled to present both sides of the story. So sometimes it comes out looking like 50-50. Well, this person says this, and this person says this. Somehow, what gets lost is the fact that 98% of people are saying this, and only 2% are saying that. Now, science wouldn't advance if we didn't allow for dissenting voices, so that is um, important. Okay, so the point I really want to make here, and I'll come to it uh, in a couple of slides here though, is that you simply can't explain what we are seeing if you don't include humans. So those of us who are geoscientists have been studying the natural environment for decades to centuries to thousands of years, and you can't explain what we're seeing if you don't include people. So, for example, I've just taken a few slides from the sixth assessment. So this particular one happens to be Arctic sea ice. And so what they've done is they've said, okay, so here's Arctic sea ice in 1950. Here's roughly what it is in, you know, 2014, 2015, around here. And then there are the projections. And what the IPCC do is they say, well, let's imagine the world if we cut our carbon emissions by 80% in the next 10 years. What would that look like? What happens if we go along with a kind of a business as usual scenario? What happens if we keep increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we're putting in? And so they come through with this set of scenarios. And sadly, um, you know, most of us use what's called the, the 8.5 scenario, which is this one down here, because that's basically what we're doing. That's where we're heading. 
Um, we've already crossed the Rubicon. There's things we simply can't do. So one of the things that you see then is we're practically ice-free by 2050. Well, why does that matter? Well, again, I, I just gave a lecture on Thursday to a first-year geography class, and one of the things I was pointing out to them is you get a feedback loop. So if you melt the Arctic ice, right, white surfaces tend to reflect solar radiation. Dark surfaces tend to absorb it. So if you get rid of the sea ice, then instead of reflecting solar radiation back to, to, to space, you absorb even more of it. If you absorb even more of it, you warm things up even more. So there's gonna be a positive feedback loop. So that's why we care about Arctic sea ice, even though we're here at Cape Germain, right? And those of you, again, who live in our area, you will have noticed, I'm sure, in the Northumberland Strait that there's not as much ice out there most winters as there was, say, 30, 40 years ago. Not a coincidence. That doesn't mean that some years we don't have lots of ice out there. But overall, there's less ice out there. So this happens to be Arctic sea ice, but you could apply this to coastal ice in lots of different countries, whether it's Sweden or uh, Canada. Okay. Secondly, then, what about sea level rise? Right. Well, sea level rise. Um, again, you know, 8.5 scenario, probably by 2100, we're looking at least a meter of sea level rise. That's a meter of what we call eustatic sea level rise. Don't write that down. You don't need to know it. All you need to know is it's the absolute going up of the water level. Right? The land that we are sitting on here right now, uh, part of Mi'kma'ki, our unceded territory, happens to be sinking as well. Okay, And so the land is actually going down and the sea level is going up. So for us, we're probably looking at a number of more like 1.5 meters by the time we get to 2100. And that's already baked in. We can't actually change that. That's, that's basically coming regardless. Right? Then you can ask the question, well, what happens uh, you know, after that? Well, I don't know. Okay. The last thing I want to do, though, is I want to point out that if you look at the data, right, and if you look at computer simulations, and these have been done, you know, thousands of times using supercomputers by research groups all across the planet, right? You know, this is our simulated, you know, natural variability here, sorry, in, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Forget the keyboard. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a game show host. OK, um, the point here simply is, is that, you know, if you look at the observed surface global temperatures, the annual changes, right, you cannot get what we're getting if you don't include human factors. So if people want to know more about global circulation models, I could talk a little bit about that. But that's how we project what's going to happen into the future with climate in terms of temperatures and ocean warming and loss of sea ice and so on. We use these models. The point here, the takeaway is that you cannot reproduce the observations without climate change as a result of human actions. We are responsible. And I know that will be debated and there's politicians in various countries that will debate that. But from a scientific point of view, this is just not debatable. You cannot reproduce what we're seeing without human beings. Okay, so what about Fiona? Anybody, does anybody remember Fiona? <laughs> Good. So that makes it a little bit easier. So Fiona had um, peak wind speeds. It would depend on where you were um, in the area. So obviously, you know, from looking at the media that um, Cape Breton and, and uh, southwest Newfoundland and so on were particularly um, hard hit. So we're looking at, you know, peak wind speeds of up to 150 kilometers an hour at East Point in, in uh, PEI, 167 kilometers um, on the west coast there of um, uh, Cape Breton, even 149 kilometers in Sydney on the north shore of Cape Breton. So these are high wind speeds. Moncton, about 100, right? And I'll come back to why I'm mentioning that. So Fiona's wind speeds, you know, were, were high. They were, they were quite high, okay? Barometric pressure. Well, we basically broke the record. And that's another thing about climate change is we're not just breaking records. We used to talk about breaking records, you know, so someone will, uh, you know, their slap shot at the NHL, you know, all-star thing will be like 0.8 of a kilometer per hour faster than the previous record. Or someone who's competitively swimming will break the record by 0.02 seconds. Right? The thing about climate change is we're breaking records. We're not breaking them, we're, we're shattering them. Right? And so, you know, Juan, which some of you may remember, right, the, the extreme low, temp um, low pressure, atmospheric pressure was 969 millibars. Right? Uh, white Juan, 
the snowstorm got down to 959 millibars. The record, you know, it's, Environment Canada have not confirmed these numbers. They do need to double check a bunch of things. But at least according to CTV News, 932 millibars, right? We completely demolished the record. Now, that's not because that's a, a record setting low per se, but what it tells me is that it means that a hurricane, a system has gotten this far north maintaining the characteristics of a hurricane, right? Because normally you go back 20, 30 years ago, it simply wouldn't have enough oomph left by the time it got to us. It could still be quite, you know, damaging, but it wouldn't have the oomph left. So that's why this is a startling number because it says that that category two hurricane, well, category four when it was further south, that it got this far north and still had the characteristics of a hurricane, right? And for those of you who've been following Ian for the last, 48 hours or so on you can see like how much devastation i mean there's parts of florida where there's there's you, you see i've seen again people are tweeting me videos and everything else like there's streets you don't see a single power pole on the entire street like there's nothing still standing down some streets so you know again you talk about a category four hurricane and storm surge these are significant so this tells me they're actually getting um to our area this is another one that's been tweeted by my colleagues around the globe because it's so startling so this is the European Space Agency using their Copernicus um, Sentinel-2 satellite. And what it is, is this is August the 21st. This is August the 25th. This is all the sediment that's been mobilized all the way around Prince Edward Island as a function of both shoreline erosion and also remobilization of sediments in the nearshore zone. And you really, I mean, again, I don't really need to even say anything, do I? I don't think. I mean, it speaks for itself, right? You know, again, you know, we're, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a challenging time because, again, my colleague uh, in the back corner would probably have agreed to me that, you know, in the 1950s, photographs really didn't lie. It really was hard to mess with photographs in a way that couldn't be detected by a true professional. We are in an era now where with digital manipulation, you can muck with photographs and make it, you know, it's hard to, it's much harder to detect changes now. So fake news is real. I mean, there are, are fake things out there. The European Space Agency probably isn't one of those agencies that is doctoring their, their images. So, you know, that's, that's what we're dealing with, okay? Hmm? Yeah, so there's Cape Germain right there. So again, oops, sorry. I guess this is... Anyway, so there's Cape Germain right there. And, and so the same thing. I mean, a little bit less of an impact on the New Brunswick shoreline, but still, nevertheless, um, you know, it is significant. I, I might just jump in and know there are the people who are watching virtually, apparently, when you swipe on the board, it doesn't change their screen. Oh. So you might have to use the keyboard. Okay, well, we'll go back a few slides then. And just make sure. Oh, it's changing now for them. Okay. So again, you know, what happened? I mean, that's the Sentinel-2, that's the space view um, looking down. Um, this is Cavendish Beach. There's a, an initiative called the Coasty Initiative, which basically involves um, having signposts and people go and take photographs with their cameras, their phones, whatever, and they can post them to a website. So that's Cavendish Beach um, before um, Fiona. That's Cavendish Beach uh, on the Sunday after um, Fiona, so probably something on the order of eight meters of sand dune um, that have uh, been eroded away and the sand is out somewhere um, in the near shore zone. Okay, so again, when I, when this happens, I get media calls and the first thing people ask is, well, Fiona's unprecedented, right? Like this is the catastrophic storm. Well, I just showed you the, the, the low pressure. So yes, Fiona in that sense is unprecedented. But the calls I was getting were about Point de Chine and Shediac and so on. Um, and if you look at that, well, it's not really so unprecedented. So if you look at Dorian from 2019, right? Dorian um, came uh, uh, up the, uh, between sort of Cape Breton and PEI. So, you know, over in Summerside here, we had peak wind speeds of 117 kilometers an hour and peak rainfall of 92. Okay, in Fiona, peak wind speeds in Summerside, 140, rainfall of about 60 millimeters. At Moncton, at the airport, peak wind speeds for both storms, about 100 kilometers an hour. Way more rain in Dorian than in Fiona. And in fact, the sustained winds in Dorian were slightly higher in Moncton 
than during Fiona. So from the Point de Chine uh, Shediac area, Fiona was not unprecedented by any means. Fiona was, you know, a normal post-tropical storm, if you want to uh, have such a thing. So what did the Point de Chine Yacht Club look like after Fiona? Well, I joined a group of my friends and we all took our boats out of the water on Friday. <laughs> And I did not leave my boat at the Point de Chine Yacht Club for Fiona, having learned, uh, well, Dorian was, came earlier in the season and essentially there was nothing we could do. Um, so we had a few boats that sustained damage. But what about the Point de Chine Yacht Club after Fiona? So again, uh, if you'd been there um, on Friday before Fiona arrived, you know, the bank was out to about here. Um, there was a fence all the way along uh, here and you know, that's now been completely eroded away. I'm, again, I'm not sure what I've done. Uh, so all this was eroded here. Um, the breakwater was eroded. I mean, in general, the Point de Chine Yacht Club uh, survived without a huge amount of obvious damage, but, you know, docks were damaged, uh, metal fittings were bent, shoreline was eroded, fence was ripped out, um, some of the electrical cables were pulled out. So, you know, that's what the Point de Chine Yacht Club looked like. Okay. What... <clears throat> what about the Point de Chine uh, Wharf? Uh, well, the Point de Chine Wharf, there's the diesel fuel tank um, there in the road. There's the Sandbar Restaurant, for those of you who know the Point de Chine Wharf. The Sandbar Restaurant that was pushed back during Dorian, which they dutifully then put back, put it up a little bit higher, but basically put it right back where it was. And there it is on the wharf after Fiona. So is there a surprise here? Not to people like me, because essentially there was a storm surge you can see a boat there with its bow up on the wharf storm surge and the same kinds of things happened that happened before so for those of you who may remember right this is what the shediac bay yacht club looked like after dorian right all the boats piled up in the corner here so dorian did significant damage so there's no surprise then that after fiona we got significant damage in my crankiest of moments, right, I was asked, well, yes, but this is still, you know, unprecedented. This is still, and I said, no, it's not. I said, one of the first public talks I did was in the summer of 2000, after the storm surge of January of 2000, which flooded Point de Chine. So 22 years ago, there was a storm surge that flooded large areas of Point de Chine. Now it didn't happen to impact the Yacht Club because it was January and there was nothing there. Not only that, but when you start to have ice, you actually do get some protection from the ice. So as the climate warms, you don't have the ice anymore. You also lose some of the protection. But my point here simply is, is that, you know, these things in terms of our coastlines, in terms of our shorelines in New Brunswick or Prince Edward Island for that matter, these are not unprecedented. They are not you know, they happen every so often and they are entirely predictable and the outcomes or the consequences are entirely predictable. Okay, so, okay. I'm focusing because today we're at Cape Germain on PEI and the north coast of the north, or so, you know, the north coast of New Brunswick on the Northumberland Strait. But just to point out, right, this is not just a, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence slash Northumberland Strait issue, right? We've got the same kinds of issues in the Bay of Fundy. And if you go and look at the dike systems in places like Wood Point um, or over at Fort Beausajour or wherever you choose to go, uh, you will see that storm surges and uh, coastal erosion and the use of rock and so on is ubiquitous over there too. And I could give a completely different talk on um, you know, on dikes and salt marsh restoration and so on and what to do on that side. But for today, we'll focus on on this side, okay? The other point I want to make then is, going back to this, well, you know, is this normal? So shoreline erosion is normal. It happens, it's going to keep happening, okay? Uh, movement of sediment is normal. It happens, it's going to keep happening, right? Is it going to get worse? Well, as I said, if you go back to the IPCC and you read through the reports from one to six, you will see that every time you get a new report, it's a little more dire than the previous report about what's happening, right? There are other things that are not accounted for. So, you know, I've just got snapshots. So I don't expect anybody to read this, 
but this is a paper that um, a short scientific publication or, or communication that appeared saying how much of the Earth's uh, ice is melting, new and old techniques combined to paint a sobering picture. Some of you may have heard a term this summer that I'd never heard before, zombie ice, um, which, well, zombie ice, it made the media. Um, but it's basically stranded ice because when your ice is melting, the question is, is the ice already in the water? So in Antarctica, there are ice shelves, but they're largely already in the water. So it's not inconsequential, but if 90% of the volume is already there, right? But if you think about Greenland and the ice melt, that water's not in the ocean at all, right? And so this is stranded ice. But the point about, uh, about papers like this is people are looking at the melt rates in the Arctic. They're looking at the melt rates for ice uh, in Greenland and saying, whoa, Actually, it's melting at a much higher rate than we originally predicted. So if you go back and look 20 years ago, what was predicted? The ice is melting faster, uh, greater volumes of water are going into the ocean, and so the consequences are occurring at a greater rate of speed. Okay? Secondly, um, you know, well, well, what about these major storms? I mean, systems will recover, but they generally won't recover in the places where they were. They will recover further inland. Unless, of course, you, we, um, decide that that's not um, uh, palatable because we have infrastructure there and we don't want it to recover further inland. We want it to recover back where it was. Well, by definition, that's going to make it increasingly risky because it's not meant to be, it's not meant to recover where it was. It's meant to recover further inland. That's what happens when sea level has been rising, which it has out here. 5,000 years ago, we could have walked over to PEI, saved yourself $50.25 or whatever it said on the sign. Um, Right, because you could walk over there because sea level's been rising for five thousand for five thousand years. It's just that now that it's rising at an accelerating rate. Okay, extreme storm sequence can offset decades of shoreline retreat. So again, it's it's a mixed blessing in terms of what's going to happen. The extreme event will cause greater shoreline erosion in certain locations, put more sediment in, but that may actually, for some systems, be good because when that sediment moves back on, it will actually replenish the beach. So in a sense, that's a that's a good thing. Um, the other piece to erosion, and this is probably where I always stumble, not stumble, you know, sort of intellectually when talking to the media, but the question I get so often is, how do we stop erosion? And I keep trying to point out that, you know, not only is it probably not possible to stop erosion, but if you stop erosion, you actually don't have what it is that we all go to the coast for beaches and salt marshes and everything else, because the whole point is erosion is what provides the sediment to make those environments. So if you want an environment that simply has a cement wall <laughs> and nothing else, then you can have that. But if you successfully stop erosion, you won't have any beaches. You won't have salt marshes, right? You, you won't have the things that we go to the coast for. So in fact, we don't want to stop erosion. Well, okay, we want to stop erosion here in front of our piece, but yeah, yeah not over there. So this is the problem with managing the coast is, you know, we don't want to stop erosion everywhere, just where we happen to be. But as we keep building along the coast, um, and again, the two weeks before Fiona sailed up towards Cap Pelé and back, and there's at least three or four, um, you know, brand new homes under construction. Uh, roof trusses aren't even on them yet. And they're, you know, right there along the shore. So we keep building infrastructure there. And that's not a critique of any individual person and the decisions that they're making, but societally, we keep doing this. So what do we do, right? We really have, um, you know, three basic options. Again, I can keep track of three things. Um, they do sort of work their way into what I call six R's. So we have some choices. We can raise and reinforce our coastal protections. So that could be dikes on the Bay of Fundy side, it could be rock revetments, it could be whatever it is, but you know, sea level's rising, storms are going to become more intense, so we can raise and reinforce our coastal protections. We can realign our coastal protections and restore natural protection. So we could move some of our infrastructure back and try to encourage um, sand dunes to uh, reform or marshes to grow or whatever it is, so we at least have some natural protection in front of our uh, coastal defenses. Or we could be radical and we could remove existing coastal protections and retreat, like simply move back and just let it go and let it go back to its um, natural state. And so uh, I borrowed this uh, photo from the Cape Germain Nature Center. Those of you who are there, many of you will know that uh, the lighthouse, you know, eventually would have simply fallen over the edge. 
um, because the shoreline was eroding. So the solution was, let's pick the lighthouse up, move it back, restore it, and that will buy us another, whatever, 100 years um, before erosion reaches uh, the, the lighthouse. So, you know, that is a, an option that has been used. But really, those are down to our choices. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to go to questions in just a moment because the other question I always get is, well, what should we do? And I say, well, I don't know what we should do because I'm an individual. I know what I would do, right? If I was living on the coast, I would live well back from the edge and I'd live up high. But that's me. Right? As a scientist, I can't tell you what to do because that's a social, that's a social economic question. I can only tell you scientifically, you know, what the risks are that you're going to face. And then you decide as a society or as an individual cottage owner uh, what you're going to, um, to do about it. So as I say, if you're here at Cape Germain, right, the, the system will take care of itself. I'm sure the bluffs out there, I haven't been out there yet, but I'll go out later on. I'm sure the bluffs eroded out there. Right, and so that's natural, that should happen, right? But the thing is, as long as Cape Germain is allowed to, uh, uh, you know, function as it naturally would, the beaches will, will return over the course of some number of months, everything will be a little bit further back, a little bit higher up, but everything will, will come back to its natural state. And then, you know, there will be another cycle of, of erosion at some point. And so over the next century, these things will happen. Probably the only thing that needs to be armored and it is, is the bridge uh, abutments there because the bridge is, uh, is important infrastructure. So that will remain armored for the foreseeable future. Um, and, but the rest of the coastline can, can do its thing. So I think with that, uh, we'll end the formal presentation and see if there are questions or questions in the chat or just general discussion. So thank you. And if anyone in the room does have a question, I would just hand you the microphone so that people who are watching online can, can hear you. Hand it down here. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Paul Bogart. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for keeping that view up in front of us. I have a comment about this local spot which uh, I'd appreciate uh, your comments on. And then I've got a much broader uh, global climate change question. So my first point is, uh, Jeff's been out here looking at this coastline off and on for as long as the Nature Center has been here. And I remember, and Jeff, I expect you remember, we did not have that bunch beach right in this curve, right in front of our buildings when we started pretty well every year, back and forth a little bit, we've been gaining. And the local guys who do maintenance for us, us tell me this morning, sure enough, we must have had erosions, as you say, out in the bluffs, haven't been there yet, but our sand beach has already grown. Yeah. It hasn't grown as much as Cavendish lost, but uh, curiously, you get exactly the kind of lose here, gain there, and we're gaining too. Uh, right in the spot that you've mentioned. So uh, I trust you've seen that as well. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. And it's partly because there's no, you know, essentially there's no coastal protection now, you know, anywhere between sort of, you know, Bayfield and, you know, what is it, Spence Cove or Spencer's Cove? You know, like we've allowed this whole piece now because it's become a national wildlife area to be natural. So we're not trying to stop the erosion of the bluffs anywhere anymore we're not trying to stop the movement of the sand from the the dunes and so on so as long as you i mean and that's again i, I it sounds so pithy uh, to say it this way but every time i get calls and people say well you know the, the beaches are going to disappear the beaches are going to disappear and what i try to point out is if you let nature take its course that can't possibly be true because if it were there would be no beaches given that sea level has been rising for five thousand years so if they were going to disappear solely as a function of sea level rise they shouldn't be here now, but yet they are. So to your point, Paul, when you allow the system to do what it naturally does, the beaches will, and even along the coast of PEI, a lot of that sand is in the near shore. It will work its way back on shore. Mm -hmm. um, but for things like the dunes to reform, they're going to want to reform a little further inland than they were. 
So if it's the national park, it's okay because they've already moved back a bunch of their infrastructure. They've abandoned several roads in PI National Park. They've moved one of their washroom stations back. So they'll just let it happen and it'll be okay. There will be other places where, you know, that's not going to be the case. People are going to want to put stuff right back where it was. Thank you. A much broader question. Early on in your talk, you mentioned two or three times that some of the changes we're going to see are baked in. Mm -hmm. I think I understand what you mean by that. What I'm curious about is, given where we are now in 22, uh, can you, can scientists guesstimate how far ahead things are baked in? Is it baked yes. into 2040? Is it baked into 2060? To see real change, you have to go out to the end of the century. Yeah, so the issue with carbon dioxide is once you put it in the atmosphere, so, so there are lots of different greenhouse gases. The reason carbon dioxide gets so much focus is because once it's in the atmosphere, it takes decades to, to work its way through the system. So the increased levels of carbon dioxide that are up there right now, uh, and this is simplistic way of explaining it, but the stuff that's up there right now will be having impacts for at least the next 50 to 100 years. So in other words, if you wanted to return to pre-industrial, you'd have to basically stop all the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, or at least the excess levels of carbon dioxide, and then you'd have to wait between one and 200 years for things to come back to. So that's what I mean by baked in. Unless we use artificial technology to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, there are things that we cannot change, which to those, again, those of us who've been doing this now since, you know, since the IPCC was formed in 1988 and the first Earth Summit in 1992, that's the frustration. After 30 years, right, the clock keeps ticking and you can get as excited as you want about doing something by 2050, but, you know, 2050, you've already, uh, uh, you've already added 60 years of, of, of CO2. So that's also why we talk about adaptation, because there are certain things that we now cannot avoid. So we have to think societally about how we're going to respond, because there's essentially nothing we can do uh, about it. I mean, we're going to have to live with the increased temperatures, particularly in the Arctic and the Antarctic. I think there was... I'm happy to pass the fifth. <laughs> I think there's a couple people over here that... Were you reaching? Um, when you just mentioned the Arctic, uh, I just thought of methane. Does methane react the same way as, as CO2, or does it uh, work its way through more quickly? So that's the issue. So methane is about 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas, but it works its way through the system much more quickly. So the methane can take care of itself within, uh, you know, a number of years as opposed to decades. So that's why CO2 gets the focus. Um, so if, for example, you change your agricultural practices and bring down the level of methane production, the results, the payoff for doing that is relatively quick. Like five to 10 years, you'll see the help of changing your agricultural systems. The thing about the Arctic that scares everybody is the amount of methane that's stored there as you keep as you keep heating the Arctic, you're going to keep melting the permafrost. As you keep melting the permafrost, you're going to release more and more methane. And, you know, but you're going to keep doing that every year. So the system will not have time to recover. So those who talk about runaway climate change, that's one of the things they're concerned about is that you just keep melting permafrost, putting up more methane, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse until you basically can't stop the freight train. I mean, until all the permafrost is melted. But that means bringing the Arctic back down to you know, 10 degrees, 15 degrees warmer than it is right now. Right. And already, again, if you look at temperature records from the Arctic, I mean, they're, they're just like they're off the charts, you know, places in the Arctic getting temperatures in the 20 in the mid 20s. It just, you know, there's nothing in the record of, of that kind of thing happening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to formulate my question so it makes sense. But uh, I, I live in Pointe du Chien. Uh, in the area that was flooded uh, four times now. Uh, and uh, this past uh, storm, Fiona, uh, seemed to be more intense in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, damage to people's uh, dwellings and right. 
tree loss and erosion as well. Uh, so there are a number of people that are now saying, well, what do I do? Uh, do I raise my, my building? Do I sell? Or So what I guess my question is, is there something with the IPCC that measures intensity? It seems to be related to intensity more so than, uh, than necessarily flooding or, yeah, it's, yeah. So, so, so there's, there's two answers to your question. So one is, you know, by the numbers, Fiona was not more intense than Dorian. But, right, what happens is the systems are getting increasingly out of equilibrium. So the consequences become more severe each time. So even with sea level rise, um, you know, sea levels risen over, you know, close to 25 centimeters in, in the last 25 years. So, so, so sea levels, you know, the starting point for sea levels that much higher than it was even not 25. I mean, so the storm surge of January, 2000 was 22 years ago. So the point is sea levels higher now than it was, but yet everything at Parley beach is essentially right where it was. So the impacts are greater because the, 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 the conditions are that much uh, worse in terms of things being out of equilibrium. So that's one answer, okay? The other answer um, ha has to do with, uh, I mean, it's just, it's happenstance. It's, it's how things happen to occur. So, you know, when it happens, for example, how close to the spring tide does it happen? So that's just, it's, it's essentially random chance. But if the same storm happens on neap tide, then it doesn't appear to be as bad because again, the starting water level is much, much lower. If it happens to occur at the peak of spring tide, just by happenstance, it's like, whoa, this is much worse. So people's perception is that it's a worse yeah. storm, yeah. right? And that's the thing about the Saxby Gale for those who've, who've studied it is people go, yeah, but dude, Saxby Gale, I mean, it's been like 150 years and it's, a, yeah, I know because you can get a storm that's just as bad as the Saxby Gale, but in the Bay of Fundy, if it happens on neap tide, you don't even notice the storm surge because the storm surge is two meters, you know, adds two meters of water, but neap tide, the high tide is two and a half meters lower than at spring tide. So you don't even notice it. It's like, hmm, well, that didn't really happen. Right? The day that it, the day that it happens where that storm surge happens on a spring high tide, you know, like this is the thing again, I don't want to divert from our purpose today, yeah. but the thing about this Chignecto Isthmus study is, you know, it's not a question of whether it's, you know, could it happen? It's going to happen. It's just a statistical question of when, which is A, unpredictable, because it's due to random chance, right, when things line up. But the, the idea is, will it happen? Yes, it will happen. Will Point Duchene be flooded again? Yes, it will, right? So the residents of Point Duchene, you know, th th those are the options, yeah. right? So you could raise and reinforce, which can, could include your own dwelling, um, raise it up, um, I had a friend who uh, came to me, I don't know, 10 years ago to build a cottage and uh, took me out to the site and said, this is where we want to put the cottage and this is what we're going to do. And I said, you know what? I won't even charge you. Move your cottage back another 25 meters over there and pay somebody to put it on screw piles and put it at this elevation. And they did. So they moved it back from where they were going to build it and they put it on steel screw piles and they raised it up a meter, 1.2 meters above the level that they were going to build it. And I said, you can thank me later because at least the water will go underneath it, right? Yeah. So, you know, that is a, you know, yeah. that is an option. Realign the coast and restore natural protection. I mean, this is a question for, for Parley Beach. You know, how many times are they going to keep trying to put the dunes back and the boardwalks back where they, where they currently are? Because I guarantee you that if they put them back where they are, we will have this conversation again, potentially, no, again, and I, I know, I mean, I do these things and I, I sound sometimes like I'm, I'm just old and cranky, partly because I am old and cranky. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, going back not to, since you're from Point Duchesne, De so I did this public lecture and it, how long have you been in Point Duchesne? De since before 2000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 70, 77. So, so in January of 2000, we had the storm surge in the public lecture um, in the summer of 2000, I went through and gave a, a talk very similar to what I just did. And I still remember this uh, person standing up at the back row who said, basically, you are full of dot, dot, dot. 
This has never happened in my life. It will never happen again. If you remember that year, there was another storm surge in November of 2000 <laughs> that took out two of the boardwalks again that had been rebuilt that summer. So within the same year, the damage was done. So back to, you know, these are the options that we have. But as a coastal scientist, the notion that, you know, oh, well, Fiona happened. So therefore, I mean, you just, I assume, have seen the results of Ian on Florida. There is nothing that says there couldn't be another hurricane work its way up the coast three weeks from now and bash us all again or potentially bash us worse. So, you know, the time to think about this was 25 years ago, but given that we can't do that, the time to think about it is now. Um, was, was part of the reason why Fiona seemed so strong with it was interacting with a, with a trough and the course, they seem to say in the news that the course was changed more inland than it would have otherwise. I think that the thing that made Fiona unprecedented is because one, yes, things are warmer and the way it interacted with the water as it moved up allowed it to get to Cape Breton and to Newfoundland as a stronger storm than has ever occurred, right? My only point about Point de Chine is that for Point de Chine itself, it was no worse than Dorian. In fact, it probably was less worse. It was probably not quite as bad as Dorian by some metrics, but to your question, because of because sea level's risen further and because things are further out of equilibrium and because a lot of stuff like the sandbar restaurant was put back right exactly where it was before Dorian, well then the impacts are are, you know, they're the they're basically the same. So, you know, in that sense, Fiona is unprecedented, no question. Um, but it's not unprecedented in terms of where we're heading because the oceans are going to continue to warm, the Gulf Stream is going to continue to warm, and, and these hurricanes are going to get further further north as full-blown hurricanes than they used to. Just a small question. You, <clears throat> most of the data was talking about wind speeds and uh, pressure, uh, but how much of a factor is wind direction? in some of the damage because it's not really reported you don't see the directions of the winds as often as you do see the velocity so the wind direction matters a lot when you're talking about damage like trees coming over and power lines and losing siding so wind direction matters wind direction doesn't matter as much though in terms of the coastal damage because it's largely the storm surge that does the damage and so if you think about pei you know, wh whether it's coming kind of from the northeast or the northwest or directly from the north doesn't in the end matter all that much because it's the elevation of the water level that really, you know, that really causes the, the damage. And even when, even the wave direction, I won't do it here, but if you look at how waves refract, you know, because of the way waves come in and refract use, because they drag on the bottom, they generally arrive fairly shore parallel anyway. So regardless of what they're doing as they come in, by the time they get to the shore, they're fairly shore um, parallel. So the wind direction in terms of coastal stuff, I mean, obviously, if it's completely off the south, then that matters. But by the time you're talking about, because these tropical storms, hurricanes and post-tropical storms, they're rotating counterclockwise and the winds are coming in so you get your strongest winds on the sort of upper right quadrant if you will or on the northeast which is why we're all familiar with the term nor'easter right that's why nor'easters are a, a problem but at that point nor'easter nor nor'west they're all going to cause damage thanks for the presentation um i'm a little bit concerned about how the general public determines what's the you know the impact of climate change as to as you said you know the normal erosion that takes place along shorelines and so forth and and whether the uh, you know the media is really fulfilling their role properly i listen to cbc a lot i would expect that to be a little bit better than some of the others but um you know this this morning i hear uh on cbc uh, national news talking about ian no mention of climate change just how bad it is and how many millions or billions or whatever it was it's going to cost and that's a record but no mention of climate change and then a few minutes later they go to east africa there's a drought this is a result of climate change so i mean i connect a lot to this or my opinion that a lot of this is connected to climate change but so what's what's the um, responsibility and are they living up to it for the ipcc to be informing people and even people like yourself to yeah. be informing that general public out there of 
this is climate change because I think it should be right up there in the front of. It. So again, I, I you know mea culpa to a certain extent. One of the problems with asking people like me, well, is this climate change? The trouble is, I can't ascribe any individual event to climate change. So uh, it predates me, but I mean, my parents talk about Hurricane Hazel going through Ontario. And, you know, one of the good outcomes of Hurricane Hazel was all the conservation authorities in Ontario that were created out of that. That was an unprecedented event. You could argue reasonably that well, what did that have to do with climate change? It was just random chance and a confluence of events. So the challenge for us as scientists is we can look at things in aggregate and say over these 50 storms, there's no way that these 50 storms could have all occurred at this intensity without climate change. But an individual storm could have occurred. One of the greatest losses of life was the hurricane that hit Galveston Island in 1902. I can't remember the year, but it's about that. Um, because one, there was no way to warn people in 1902, no reasonable way to warn people. Um, but that was, you know, that was a devastating hurricane. So you can go back 100 years and find devastating hurricanes. So in that sense, it's a challenge because when the media want us as scientists to say that was caused by climate change, an individual event, we can't do it. Or at least we don't want to do it because it, it may not be true. So you have to look at things in the whole, holistically. That's one problem. And the other problem, as I said, there's a very funny uh, video by uh, John Oliver, and I, I won't, uh, I recommend it, but it's got a lot of dirty words in it. Um, so I don't usually show it in public. But, he, you know, he, he does, um, you know, he does this shtick where he does a couple of things. One of them is he has a scientifically correct debate. So he brings in, he's got the anchor desk and he brings in the expert, but then he brings in the other expert, but then he brings in the other 98 scientists for the debate because he wants a statistically accurate debate. Because media, again, I understand why, but they, they feel beholden to bring in two voices one that says one thing and one that says the other. So they're providing balanced coverage. But it leaves the public thinking it's a 50-50 ball. You know, well, half the people think this and half the people think that when it's not. And that's the thing about the IPCC. It's like 98% of people think this and 2% think that. You can go find a PhD online, no problem, that will tell you that climate change isn't true. It's all natural. Um, you know, it's not hard to find somebody with letters after their name to say that stuff. It's just that nobody... You know, most credible scientists just kind of go, well, what are we supposed to do? Like, we've done what we can for society to explain what the risks are. Society will now decide what they're going to do about it or not do about it, as the, as the case may be. So, you know, that's a, you know, that's a, a thing. And there's still a line in, um, in that, in that uh, segment. If you want to watch it, it's just something like a poll shows that, you know, 25% of Americans don't believe, you know, blah, blah, blah. What does that tell us? tells us that 25% of Americans are wrong. <laughs> Again, it's a bit pithy, but I mean, he's trying to make the point using humor and using uh, comedy to say that, you know, well, what does it matter that someone's opinion is this? You know, how, how is that science? Opinion is not science. Um, but we all have to tread carefully. We've all just been through COVID. We've all been through debates about vaccines. You got to tread carefully. I know what the science says. I know what my personal choices were and are. Right. But you don't want to tromp on other people. But if they simply say, well, you know, this is because I don't believe it. Well, OK, well, then show me the evidence. If you still choose not to, that's fine. That's a personal choice. And I feel a little bit about that in the coastline if you choose to do things. But the reality is other things happen. First responders are put at risk trying to rescue people who refuse to leave their home. So other people's lives are put at risk. You know, secondly, as I say, when you build shoreline protections, you actually deprive the natural system of its sediment. So it's not without consequences when people do these things, right? That does cost all of us. And then of course, there's the last thing, which is governments perpetually saying, yeah, no, of course you're on your own. You either have insurance or whatever, but you know, every time these things happen, the first thing the governments do within days is announce emergency funding programs to fund people to rebuild, to fund people to put things right back where they were. So that's your, your tax dollars, my tax dollars at work, putting things back where they were. Um, now, credit to New Brunswick on certain uh, files. New Brunswick has said no. Some of the flooding in the St. John River Valley, they said, we will, you get a one-time payment or we will buy your property and turn it into green space. And that's why I say, if you go back and look at Ontario, uh, the creation of all those, those conservation authorities after Hurricane Hazel was partly because the government said, we're going to turn this into green space. It was very forward thinking in a sense, because you go to a lot of, I grew up in Guelph and you, you know, all along the river is soccer fields and parks and and trails that you can ride on, but almost no infrastructure. They didn't rebuild right beside the rivers after that event. 
we might see insurance companies driving a lot of the change that needs to take place. Oh, they've already done it. They've already, they, yeah. insurance companies are already doing it, but that's why the clamoring then for public funding to make up where the insurance companies have said, we're not going to, we're not going to cover this anymore. They don't cover storm surge damage in part. And I, again, I heard a comment on CBC and I don't want to dominate because I know we're running out of time, but somebody saying, you know, essentially, well, they should cover this because it's, you, you know, you, 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 insurance has to cover things because we, we don't know when we're going to have an accident. If you think about a car, that's true. We don't know when we're going to have an accident. Maybe we'll go for 35 years and never have an accident. But back to insurance companies, you can't, they're not going to cover you for storm surge because they say, I'm sorry, this isn't an accident. I listened to some guy who told me that this is going to happen again. So we know it's, it's a, a predictable outcome. So unlike an accident where a tree falls in your house that looked perfectly healthy, you maybe couldn't have predicted it or whatever. Storm surge damage, insurance companies say, this is perfectly predictable. We've got the flood maps. We know this is going to happen. No, we're not going to cover you. Or the premiums are going to be so absurd, $20,000 a year in premiums, that, that, you won't, that people won't buy the insurance anyway. That's what's happening in the United States. You can buy insurance, but the premiums are so crazy that, that, that people just don't buy the insurance. So, so maybe I'm going to end the questioning here with the comment that we better start voting responsible governments into place to start making the changes that need to be recognizing that this whole climate change uh, effects on not just coastline, but people rebuilding in places where they shouldn't be. And someone's got to take responsibility to make the changes and Grassroots is, I, mean, I guess, from my perspective, is we have to vote in a few more Green Party people <laughs> to start making those changes happen. Again, as I often say tongue in cheek, I know how I vote. <laughs> but, you know, again, and I'm a pragmatist. I, I understand that we're going to have places like Parley Beach. And we want access to the coast. We want people to be able to the, go to the coast. And the National Park in PEI, PEI National Park is one of the five top, you know, grossing uh, visited parks in, in Canada, I think. I think it's in the top five. Um, so we want those things, but you can have those things without putting, you know, permanent buildings in those zones. Or you can have those things without putting permanent boardwalks in. You can put the boardwalks in and then you can bring a boom truck in and lift them out. Um, at the end of uh, whatever, after Labor Day weekend. So there's ways to work with the coastline. And you look at other jurisdictions um, in Europe in particular, where they're working with their coastlines. They're starting to take these steps where they have movable infrastructure or whatever. So there's ways to do it. Um, but it's pretty clear that the way to do it is not to simply repeat the same thing over again and hope for a different outcome. There, there's a saying for that too, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you. And, very and much. I, I will note we are at eleven here, but there are a couple of questions oh, online. Sure. I'd just like to quickly get through if that's okay. I've been waiting patiently. Are you okay? I'm stealing, stealing you from your time. Um, so, so the first one is, is from Samira. Uh, Thanks. It was great and very inspiring presentation. Do you use natural-based innovative technologies to restore the nature? Uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, they have the sand motor system to prevent further erosion. They do, and nature-based solutions, that's what I spend most of my time on right now, but it has more to do with restoring marshes on the other side. Um, but even their sand motor systems, they're not trying to move them back in the same place. The Netherlands is actually digging holes. It causes some of my colleagues conniptions, but there are places in the Netherlands where they're actually digging holes in the dunes. And if there's any country on the planet that depends on their dunes and coastal infrastructure to protect. But the thing is, they've already realized already, they realize that if they don't let the coastal dunes move back, then they're going to get out of equilibrium with the system and they're going to be more uh, susceptible to severe erosion during storms. So they're actively regener or, uh, reactivating the dunes to get them to move further inland. Controversial, yes. So, you know, are they doing these things? But again, you can't make enough sand. You can't, it's not economically viable to get enough sand to artificially rebuild your dunes. If you're Miami Beach, Yes, you can, because you've got billions of dollars of infrastructure to do Miami Beach. Can you do the whole North Shore of PEI? Right, not a chance. Like it just the costs would be astronomical to try and bring in enough sand to, to do that. So yes, nature-based solutions, totally a fan. Um, work with nature, don't fight it. But I, I actually just wrote a paper 
that uh, was published earlier this year about a, what we call accommodation space. The best thing you can do is make sure there's accommodation space behind your coastal marshes or your coastal dunes or your beaches or whatever it is so that the thing has got a place to migrate to. Because with rising sea level, it has to migrate. If you stop it from migrating by building a wall, a building, a highway, a railway, it doesn't matter what it is. If you stop it from migrating, it will eventually disappear because it's got no place to go. Perfect. Thank you. And just one other uh, question here from Brenda. So I'm unclear about your comment on Parley Beach. How many times are they going to replace the dunes? Are you suggesting that they shouldn't replace the dunes or do something else or nothing at all? No, I'm suggesting, uh, I can't answer the question how many times, I don't know. Um, I'm suggesting that at Parley Beach, there should be a, a management plan that involves retreat, that involves moving back, right? That involves, uh, you know, I'd have to look at the maps, but I mean, they didn't build that brand new uh, restaurant, you know, complex thing that long ago. Well, how long ago was that built? So, was it that long? Okay, maybe, maybe it was that far back. And anyway, the point being that, you know, Parley Beach, Parley Beach should continue to exist, hopefully for the rest of my lifetime and my kids' lifetime. Um, but Parley Beach is only going to be healthy if it's allowed to move back, if the dunes are allowed to move back. If you keep, which is what they've been doing, if you keep harvesting sand off the Sheen Bank with, with heavy equipment and trucking it back and putting the dunes right back where they are, then you're just going to keep doing it in, in perpetuity because you're trying to keep a system which is already out of equilibrium with, the na with nature in its given location. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that we shouldn't have Parley Beach or that it shouldn't be an attraction and then people shouldn't go there and enjoy it. But start planning to move stuff back. Perfect. Well, or even, even let... Again, even naturally, sure, but I mean, again, they're, they're, they've already used heavy equipment to repair the dunes in places, so even if you're going to use heavy equipment, but at least move it back. Start to plan to move it back. Move the infrastructure back. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for that informative presentation. It's really fascinating to hear about uh, your work and research on coastal geomorphology and climate change, uh, an important and uh, very timely topic given the most recent storm event. And so our next uh, presentation is going to be by Amanda Marlin with EOS Eco Energy, uh, who will be speaking about community-based approaches to adaptation. But we'll just take a quick two to three minute break to transition over and to get the presentation set up.